Brunero Rosa, CEO of Rosen Rubini Associates. Good morning and thank you so much for joining us. So I'd like to kick off, of course, with market action. Um, I was wondering, do you think that um, this is a little over-exaggerated when it comes to the major selling that we are witnessing today, uh, when it comes to European stocks and, of course, your stock futures? No, it seems justified to me. I mean, uh, Omicron has just arrived. There's been plenty of uncertainty of all the economic impact it could have. Uh, by the restrictions the governments might be imposing and to some extent have already been imposing in the last few days uh, in Germany, in Netherlands, in Belgium, in the UK and so on and so forth banning of various flights uh, uh, from South Africa and so uh, the climate of uncertainty as Powell said has increased massively and uh, when there's uncertainty market participants tend to have a much less constructive sentiment and, and therefore the, the, there are the sell-offs that we're seeing those days. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that, for example, President Biden said that they are going to collaborate with pharmaceutical companies uh, for research and, of course, new vaccines against this Omicron variant, but um, they do not plan to um, impose any kind of restrictive um, measures. So I was wondering, in this case, um, are there any kind of risk um, for the U.S. economy specifically related to the Omicron? I mean, the risks are for the global economy, not just the U.S. economy. Every economy can be affected by that. It typically depends on the type of restrictions that might be imposed. Now, in the past, the U.S. had been a bit of a patchwork. We saw pretty tough restrictions in New York and California, almost no restrictions in Florida, for example. Uh, and the southern part of the country tends to be less affected uh, by the virus, given a much more um, a much warmer climate, which in, you know makes life much easier for the healthcare professionals. Um, but not all countries uh, have this luck, and some of them, especially in Europe, have been already planning uh, much tougher restrictions. The hope, of course, is that we will not go back to the type of lockdowns that we had before. Now, to avoid the lockdowns, we were all hoping on the effects of the vaccines. Most of us have received two doses, some of us even three doses, the so-called booster. And now the Moderna chief tells us, ah, I'm not sure whether our vaccines are going to be helpful against this new variant, let alone recent discoveries that said that uh, the efficacy of all vaccines tends to wane five to six months after the second dose, which is a pretty low level of uh, uh, coverage in terms of time span. So if we are lucky, we are going to have a series of vaccine, maybe three, four, five doses every six months or something, and maybe we can get out of it. But otherwise, uh, the point is that we cannot follow all those variants forever. We need to find probably a better solution to that, and maybe vaccines are not going to be able to provide that long term. We don't know it just yet. Yeah, that's that's pretty important issue. So before we move to central banks, uh, I just wanted to show everyone, of course, um, the economic calendar. It was pretty interesting today when it comes to uh, European inflation, year on year 4.9 percent, uh, core inflation rate year on year 2.6 percent, and of course month on month 0.5 percent. This is um, in the eurozone once again, pretty high levels over there. Uh, I was wondering, considering the current circumstances and the Omicron variant, which is certainly causing lockdowns in Austria, in Holland, uh, restrictions in Germany so far. Um, what are central bankers supposed to do? From one side, inflationary pressures to the upside. From the other side, once again, scenario that we saw 12 months ago. Yes, the, sorry, the nightmare scenario for central bankers. Uh, this is the negative supply shocks, which tend to have a hit on uh, growth and uh, uh, push up inflation, which is exactly the type of combinations that central banks don't like. Um, and so here is a judgment call they need to make, which one needs to be addressed first, uh, or if they can divide up the job with the governments and, and count on fiscal support to economic activity, which means they can focus mostly on inflation rather than 
uh, economic activity. The problem with this central bank uh, in the Eurozone is that in uh, October, uh, Christine Lagarde said that the pandemic emergency program will be finished in March because they expect the pandemic emergency to be finished by March. Now, this may be true or not true at this stage, we don't know. Clearly, if the winter goes relatively w well in spite of the variant, maybe by March the emergency is over and therefore the ECB needs to decide what to do in December, which is pretty close by the way. Yeah. Or if the variant uh, turns out to be so much worse than currently anticipated, we might not think that uh, the, the pandemic is emergency in fact over by March and we might need to postpone it to say September 2022, in which case then the entire policy making of the ECB might need to be readjusted equally for the Fed who has started tapering in mid-November but they say they can adjust the pace of tapering over time if new economic conditions uh, uh, emerge and let alone all other central banks who are thinking about increasing rates including uh, the Bank of England, Norges Bank and uh, all other uh, minor G10 central banks around the globe that are uh, on the verge of increasing rates. So. Clearly, if the variant turns out to be too much worse than currently anticipated, the uh, moves planned by the central banks will need to be, at the very least, rescheduled, or if things really turn to be very bad, they might need to be rethought. So I was wondering, um, when it comes to the ECB, do you think that the PEP could be extended past March 2022? That strongly depends on how the uh, variant term, turns out to be. Uh, if in the next, so the meeting is on the 16th, we got about two weeks. In the next couple of weeks it should be relatively clear um, what this variant is able to do with respect especially to the efficacy of vaccines. If it's able to circumvent the efficacy of vaccines, and so we are almost weaponless against this variant in the short term, until new vaccines uh, are developed, well then it's very hard to say that the pandemic emergency is over in March and the ECB might need to postpone by at least six more months. If instead this variant is deemed to be relatively benign, we don't know just yet, then the ECB can declare the emergency over by March and then uh, develop some form of bridge facility that uh, will allow uh, uh, the reduction in the asset purchases to be much more gradual than it would be if PEP were, were to be stopped uh, suddenly and going from 90 billion a month to around 20 billion. Um, in release remarks, of course, Jay Paul said that factors pushing inflation upward will linger well into next year. This is what he's going to say to the Senate uh, later today. So I was wondering, considering the, the context, you just said that also, of course, the tapering could be readjusted if that is necessary or that will be necessary. So what about inflationary pressures, considering the fact that the Omicron var variant and, and, and the fact that we don't have a vaccine that is um, efficient against, of course, um, this variant. What about um, rate hikes and, and what do you think markets are pricing in, in terms of rate hikes? So, f first, we don't know just yet whether the vaccine is going to be effective or not. Let's, let's leave scientists sometimes to figure this out. Yeah, sure. I'm Second, just saying what the Moderna CEO said and he said that they, no, no, they are going to need a new vaccine, literally. And I understand that, although he has vested interest. So let's see what the scientists say about the vaccines. Now the question is uh, how central bankers will react. As I was saying, they don't react to vaccines, they react to restrictions. Uh, and restrictions depend on how dangerous the, the, the variant is and whether vaccines are effective or not. So there's a bit of a chain of events that need to occur before central bankers decide uh, what to do. I think um, it makes some sense for uh, central bankers to rethink about the scheduling of their price actions, as I was saying, and for markets to reprice also the timing of rate hikes, pushing them back. 
by a few months, that seems a sensible thing to do. Um, but again, we might be surprised on the upside and we might find that actually this variant, as somebody's saying, in fact, it's not an isolated opinion, as somebody's saying, may not be as bad as currently feared. In terms of not perhaps infection, it might be extremely infectious, but not very dangerous. In which case, some scientists is saying it could be good news in the sense it could become like a normal flu or, or even, even better like a cold. In which, in which case everybody gets it, so it's very infectious, but it's not very malign, which to some extent is what we really want this, this uh, virus to turn into, uh, so that we have herd immunity, everybody gets it, but nobody gets really super affected by that, and then we finally turn the page on the pandemic. We just don't know yet uh, how deadly in particular this um, new variant can be. And now, and now, dangerous for for health. We'll we'll need to wait a couple of weeks before uh, uh, getting there. And central banks, the major ones, as we speak, we spoke so far in ECB and Fed, have a, exactly a couple of weeks uh, to decide. All right. Thank you very much, Brunel Rosa, CEO Rosen Verbini Associates. Thank you for joining us, and have a great day ahead. Thank you very much. Have a good day.